Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. It was a beautiful Saturday in late spring, and I decided to fire up the grill and have a neighborhood cookout. I sent out invites to all the families on our street, and several enthusiastically RSVP'd. Even though about half our street belonged to the Homeowners Association, the rest of us weren't members. But that had never been an issue in the past. We'd always gotten along fine with the Homeowner Association folks. That is, until the new board president arrived. Let's call her Linda. She was the epitome of an entitled, nosy Karen. From the moment she moved here, Linda made it her life's mission to stick her nose into everyone's business, homeowner association or not. Noise complaints, petty fines over mailbox colors, and constant pestering about joining the association. Linda was a neighborhood menace. I largely ignored her antics and calls to become part of the homeowner association. My home, my rules was my motto. But Linda clearly had a problem with my defiant attitude. Anytime we crossed paths, she'd frown and complain about my unkempt lawn or the color of my shutters not being approved. I'd just smile politely and continue on with my day. The morning of the cookout, I began setting up tables and chairs in my backyard around 10 a.m. The tantalizing aroma of barbecue chicken and ribs on the grill soon filled the air. By noon, neighbors started showing up with salads, desserts, and drinks in hand. The kids laughed and played while the adults caught up on neighborhood gossip. It was a lively atmosphere with people chatting and music playing in the background. Suddenly I heard the angry stomping of feet coming from next door. Linda burst into my backyard, face red with fury, and made a beeline for me. What do you think you're doing? She yelled. This cookout is against homeowner association rules. I calmly replied, Linda, I'm not part of the homeowner association. I'm just having a small get-together with some neighbors. Let's not make this a big deal. But Linda was having none of it. Unauthorized social events are prohibited, the smell of meat is offensive, and the noise level is unacceptable. I notice curious faces peeking over fences and parents pulling their kids closer. Sensing the tension, I said, Linda, I invited you to join us. We're keeping it under control. It's just a casual barbecue. You will shut this unlawful party down immediately or I'm calling the police, she threatened. Go right ahead, I shrugged refusing to let her ruin our fun. As Linda stormed off, I thought that was the end of it. But ten minutes later, a police car rolled up. Officer Hernandez approached me with an apologetic look. He knew Linda's dramatics were the reason he was here. Sorry to bother you folks, he said. I'm just following up on a noise complaint. I don't actually hear any loud music or partying. You guys seem fine. We're just having a relaxed barbecue, officer, I confirmed. He nodded. That's what I thought. You enjoy yourselves. I'll tell the complainant everything is under control here. Just as he turned to leave, Linda came charging back into my yard, yelling and waving her arms like a madwoman. Officer, arrest this man immediately for violating homeowner association codes against large gatherings. Officer Hernandez rubbed his temples and calmly said, Ma'am, I explained to you earlier that I have no grounds to shut down his gathering unless there's excessive noise or disturbance of the peace. That seemed to set her off even more. She grabbed a can of soda off a table and declared, Well then, I'll disturb the peace until you enforce the rules. And with that, she shook up the can and sprayed sticky cola all over my unsuspecting eight-year-old son who was standing nearby. He looked down at his soda-drenched shirt in shock, then immediately burst into tears. Before I could even react, Linda wound up and smacked my child hard across the face. That was the final straw. An enraged fatherly instinct took over me. As Linda raised her hand to strike again, I lunged forward and grabbed her wrist tightly. Officer Hernandez immediately pulled me back while restraining a shrieking, struggling Linda. He whipped out handcuffs, saying, Ma'am, you're under arrest for assaulting a minor. As Linda was Mirandized and hauled away in a police cruiser, I comforted my son and made sure he was unharmed. Hernandez took down details of the incident and recommended I file for a restraining order against Linda on behalf of my child. Neighbors who witnessed the chaos offered sympathies and reassured me I'd done nothing wrong. A few days later, Linda showed up at my door with a lawyer in tow, threatening to sue me for assault. I showed them the footage from my security camera, which clearly recorded her attacking my son unprovoked. Her lawyer turned pale and promptly informed her she didn't have a case. At the next homeowner association meeting, Linda's conduct was brought to light resulting in a unanimous vote by the board to remove her as president. The new Homeowner Association board reversed her ridiculous party ban and cookout restrictions, restoring harmony to the neighborhood once more.
As for Linda, she earned herself a criminal record and is banned from contacting my family. I filed that restraining order against her as well as a civil lawsuit. Thanks to witnesses and camera footage, I easily won damages for the emotional trauma caused to my son. Karma sure came back hard for that entitled homeowner association Karen. The neighborhood has been peaceful and quiet without her causing trouble, and I can finally host my cookouts in blissful freedom. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Okay, I'll share another revenge. I'm only vengeful when someone deserves it, and that's usually often, so I'll share one I did from 2011. Anyone who has seen my posts know I used to work in the private security field. Not mall cops, but highly trained and skilled and armed security. We worked residential buildings and complexes that were very high-end, like $200,000 cars in the parking garage is high-end. Now places like this are Karen Central. Imagine apartments full of Karens and entitled teenagers. Now the company owner was awesome. A cop as his regular job, he understood what we faced. His advice was to be nice but put the hammer down if you have to and don't take their crap. Also that if we didn't get two complaints a month about us for worthless crap that were, weren't engaging the residents enough, lol. So, this is important to the revenge. Each supervisor had 10, 15 properties under their control. Regular officers patrolled them, but we were in charge of helping with evictions, attending town halls on security issues, deciding how an officer patrols or updating what areas are being a problem or needing checked. I had 12. Now in this one apartment complex, we had a couple always calling us. We has an emergency line open from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. When we get there, they cry about their upstairs neighbor. It was a list of things they just changed. Stomping, music, talking, cooking smells, their dog going number one on the balcony and it dripping onto theirs. Valid complaints, if we found evidence and we never did. When they seen we were starting to question if they were real, they changed tactics and went racist. The couple above them were a sweet and wonderful middle-aged Asian couple. Husband was an immigrant, but the wife was a born and raised American. These racist creatins had only talked to the husband, so they assumed, as all racists do, that they were both immigrants. SP, this white sheet wearing couple, started making comments like those Asians, and they are in America. Why can't they cook American food, and I'm afraid to be in the parking garage when one of them is driving in it. While it angered me, those comments alone weren't enough for an eviction. Only thing I could do was have my officers put exact phrasing in the report. I did ask the property manager about the comments, and she said, if they didn't say them to the residents and the residents didn't complain, there wasn't much she could do. So I tried to think of some way to get them evicted. Not only were they lying to get a couple evicted, but were calling in false things and wasting the officers' time to respond. And they didn't call just every once in a while. They called sometimes twice in on night, usually five, eight times a week. So a month later, the opportunity was handed to me. The Asian couple called me during the day and informed me they were going out of the country, China, for two weeks, and no one would be in their apartment. They told me this just in case the other couple start complaining I would know they were lying, and asked to check their door once a night to make sure it was locked and not broken into. I informed the Asian couple to not tell their neighbor, none of them that they were leaving, and besides myself, only tell the property manager. We had a patrol meeting that night. Officers didn't work one specific region, so I told them all my plan. I wanted them to respond each time they call and write down exactly what they said happened, and also any racial terms, no matter how minor, mark the report urgent and send it out. We had an online system for all business. Email, schedules, report submitting, you get the idea. So away we go. During those 14 days, they complained 18 times. Everything was documented, and I took it to the manager. She looked it over and said, let's evict them. Side note, the client gets charged more for emergency response than they do for regular patrols meaning their lies were costing moan. So, there was no homeowner association because they were rentals. In this situation myself, the property manager and the tenants sit down at a table. The charges for eviction are read. If the eviction of security related, then I say what violations have been broken, etc. Not opinions, just facts based on the reports which the tenants get a copy of. Then the tenants have a right to speak and ask questions. The property manager then decides what happens next. Do they stay or do they go? So they were sent a formal letter stating they were facing eviction and had 10 days to set up a meeting. If not, the eviction will be processed. They set one up. I get there and the a-hole couple and the manager are already present. The wife immediately digs into me because I was armed. Uniforms for those situations are a dress shirt, slacks, tie, and one weapon and one magazine. Thing P.S. like elections can be dangerous. I just politely informed her that it was my uniform and not her call to make. She tried to say she felt uncomfortable and wanted to reschedule, 
but the manager said this happens now or I will evict you, so they agreed to continue. Now for legal reasons, these sessions were recorded by video. That way the tenant can't lie in eviction court or sue. In front of me were all 18 reports and went over each one. Time, date, who called apartment number. I also read out each line telling them to tell me what they feel is false and what is true. The only thing they said the racial terms weren't true. At the end of each report, I basically said the report is accurate in the fact that tenants in apartment XYZ were playing their music to loud, but you are claiming the comments about their race or false. I got a yes answer every time. About the seventh one, I think the wife caught one. She started complaining that I was dragging it out. I just smiled politely and reminded her that this was my time and she ample opportunity to object and ask me questions, but only after I was done, and then went through the rest and let them build a defense. Then after I was done getting the admit to lies, I informed them that tenants in said apartment were actually out of the country at the time of those 18 reports, and that the tenants provided proof that they were gone, and my officers checked the apartment one time a night and confirmed that it was empty. Then I smiled pleasantly and ended my part, but the look on their face was a mix of anger and fear. They didn't have a defense, basically saying myself and the manager were choosing immigrants over Americans. Oh, did I mention the manager is an immigrant? That went over like a hand grenade in a collection plate. Once they said that she stopped it and told them she was, that made matters worse because they said she was just taking up for her own kind. During this, I'm calm and collected. Inside my mind, I'm thinking, oh, crap. After a few more racial remarks, the manager just stopped them and said guilty, and she would process the eviction paperwork with the courts in the morning. Long story short, they were given 14 days. From what I heard, the judge gave them 30 until they called him a racial name. I was able to call the nice Asian couple and let them know that it was over, and they didn't have to worry because we would no longer respond to calls about their apartment for the next 14 days until eviction came through and the bad tenants left. But they were welcome to call anytime if they need help or have an issue. Security officers want to help so bad, but are limited by either laws, property management rule, or both, so it is nice to do some good. The next one is a petty revenge story. To set the scene, I was on my bus and going to my retrain sessions as I am reorienting myself profession-wise. Usually, I am pretty silent and tend to minding my own business. Under our current situation, there is an order to wear masks on public transport, unless you have a doctor's note that says you shouldn't. Enter the entitled Karen E.K. First of all, on the buses, there are usually four-seaters and two-seaters. I was on a two-seater, minding my business. Here comes E.K., grabbing my backpack and throwing it at me to place herself without even asking if I'd let her, which was not nice at all, but okay. I just glanced at her and saw she had no mask on. As I have several health conditions that make me a risk patient and endangered towards corona, that was a big no for me. I, mean, I did what every reasonable person would and told her politely that nobody likes to wear those masks, but it is necessary, and if she was to please put on a mask or sit somewhere else, as I don't want to get infected. I don't know what exactly made her snap, but her face went red, and E.K. went on a rant, lecturing me about how masks are bad for your health, being controlled by the government, etc. I told her that she does not have to lecture me, that I respect her opinion, but it is required to wear one, and I feel uncomfortable with her so close to me without one. She then went even redder and started fake coughing at my face to provoke me like a little child. I really wanted to slap her at that point, but decided just to stand up and tell the bus driver, who then asked for her ID, and kicked her off their bus, and told her she is now banned from public transport. He asked me if he should call the police so I could press charges for assault and harassment against her, but I declined as I was already being late. <laughs> next time something like this happens, I will definitely do that. I am sick and tired of those idiots. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I live in a housing cooperative. I have no idea if there is something equivalent in other countries, but I live in Norway. It's essentially where you own your own apartment but the cooperative owns the buildings and the land. If you're going to make changes to the building, you'll have to apply for a permit. Otherwise, it's generally do as you please, as long as you don't bother your neighbors. Anyways, I put up a small greenhouse on my private patio. As many others had done, but not this exact type. This was an aluminum construction, not a frame with a loose plastic cover kind. The building manager, who is best described as a triple Karen, threw a fit. She actually watched me spending three days assembling the greenhouse, then the next day she called me and threw a fit. Not because I put up a greenhouse, but because I had used screws to fasten it to the patio for stability. Apparently I was not allowed to use screws on the floorboards, as this was considered changes to the building in her mind. And I had destroyed the floorboards. Never mind the whole patio was built with, wait for it, 
Screws, though the floorboards. Screws in the wall were okay, she'd told me, in response to me asking about why she'd put up shelves on her patio herself, but not the floorboards. Apparently the difference was monumental, and everyone should just know this, intuitively. Nowhere, literally nowhere, does it say fastening things to the floorboards or putting screws in the floorboards is not allowed. Not in the house rules, my contract, or in the National Housing Cooperative's law. But she was furious I had done this. I took a deep breath, and as I am quite creative, I immediately thought of a workaround. I'll just put it on wheels then, I made a big number of saying that fastening was essential, because otherwise the greenhouse would not be stable enough to withstand wind. She said she understood this, but I had now ruined the co-op's property, and this was a really serious matter. She told me to send an application for a permit to see if she could find a way to get approval from the board. But she could not guarantee I could keep it, she said, with the fakest of sympathies. So I sent the application with photos, saying what I had done, and that I didn't think I had to apply to do it, as I never considered putting in a prefabricated greenhouse would be seen as changes to the building. My application was rejected as I anticipated, but she worded the rejection exactly as I hoped she would. I was not allowed to put in a fastened greenhouse, and she probably thought she'd been clever when she included that I was not allowed to put the greenhouse on my front lawn neither. I had worked the it needs to be fastened to be stable, angle hard, because I hoped she, as the Karen she is, would fall for that reverse psychology. So I proceeded to put the greenhouse on wheels. I made a frame from 2 by 4 ES and put eight small furniture wheels under the frame. I then lifted and screwed the greenhouse onto the frame. I put some boards on the sides just above the ground to stop the draft. Boom, mobile greenhouse. I can slide it all over the patio. I put some hooks in the walls and used transport straps to secure the whole thing to the wall for stability. The walls were okay to put screws in, remember? So in effect, my greenhouse is now in the exact same location, four inches taller and with ugly blue ribbons tying it to the wall, and the patio now has 22 open screw holes, ready to be filled with rainwater in the fall. But oh well, as she's repeatedly told me, it's not my patio. Then I send an orientation email to the building manager with photos and videos of the sliding greenhouse, with the rest of the board members on copy, where I explained in detail what I had done, and how every step was in compliance with the rejection email I had received, which I of course included. I said the greenhouse was now to be considered a piece of mobile patio furniture, just like my sofa and chairs were, and that I now considered this subject to be a closed matter. I've not heard a single word from any of them. It's been over a week. I think I got her. I can't imagine she'll find a loophole that lets her legally dictate what patio furniture is allowed and not in the co-op, since the patios are stated to be for every apartment owner's private usage. So when Christmas comes, I'm planning to decorate the greenhouse with lights. Make it pretty. Because every time Karen steps out of her front door, she has to face my patio where she's looking straight at my greenhouse. The least I can do is make it pretty for her, right? The next one is an entitled people story. I, 27M, and my wife, 30F, were running a couple errands on my day off. And as is customary being humans that are alive and possessing a functioning stomach, we got hungry. I took a quick detour to a well-known Chinese food chain because I was in the mood for some orange chicken. My wife stayed in the car while I ran in to grab the food. There weren't very many people inside, and I was like, sweet, I should be in and out of here pretty quick. Little did I know that one of the three people standing in front of me was a Karen. There was a couple in front of me that looked like they were in their early 20s and a man ahead of them who looked like he was in his late 20s. The girl was reasonably attractive and dressed in pajamas, definitely not the kind of look you'd normally see with a Karen, which is why I was so thrown off by what she said to me. The two guys order their food without incident. Now when the girl orders her food, I notice she happens to be ordering the exact same thing I want to order for my wife. Crazy, I know. When the staff member asks me what I want, I order the same thing. And the girl, hearing what I ordered, looks back at me with the most disgusted look on her face and says, I have a boyfriend, you creep. Are you trying to get with me or something? Before I can even get a word in edgewise, she walks off in a huff to join her BF at the till. She continues to glare at me once or twice while her BF rolls his eyes and finishes paying. Both me and the staff member look at each other thinking, did she really just say that? Then the nice middle-aged Chinese woman serving me says to me, I'll give you a little extra. I turn back to her and say, thanks my wife will really appreciate that. Can I get an order of orange chicken too for myself? Clarifying edit. I didn't word this very well before as evidenced by some of the replies, so I added a couple tiny details to clarify. I ordered my wife's meal first, which is what the girl heard. 
She wanted teriyaki chicken, which is what the entitled girl ordered. I ordered the orange chicken after the nice Chinese woman offered me extra teriyaki chicken. The entitled woman cut me off before I could order my food. Sorry for the confusion. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.